what, what, we, what we can try and simulate now is if you get struck by lightning and it, try, it goes through your core... So this is actually quite dangerous, this bit now. This is, yeah, this don't, would, this would don't do this at home. OK. Now, just to reassure everyone, this is not connected yet, even though I plugged it in, until these two buttons are pressed. OK. OK, so that, that's a gherkin. Yep. And if, so imagine that's you, you get hit by lightning, and now it's going through the core of your being. So first of all, you see it boiling quite quickly, because there's huge amounts of current going through there. So it's boiling up, steam's coming out, and then it starts breaking down the very fabric of the gherkin, which could be you. <laughs> and then the temperatures, wow, that's, the temperatures that's quite go. To boil, isn't it? Yeah. Come on. Oh there yes. There we go. There we go. And then it's so hot, you're getting actually light coming off it, and that light is a particular orange yellow, which you might recognise, yeah, Dara. That's, that's street light. That's, that's yeah. sodium light. And it's exactly the same way. I mean, that is sodium from the salt in the gherkin. Wow. <laughs> okay. It's is it? Ooh, ow. Wow. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite a few thousand degrees, probably, inside there. Is it OK to go in? Is that all going to be all right? Yeah. OK, so that's the effect yeah. it'll actually have, have on yeah, flesh. Yeah. So but the path, is there a vivid way of seeing the, very, the, the actual okay. path? So, so the thing is, why does lightning happen? Because it's, it's, it's in a high charge trying to get through the air. The air is an insulator, so yeah. how does it get through? So it has to break down the air and make it into a conductor. And there's a really fantastic demo which I would like to show you, which sort of reproduces that situation. So this is... Let's say this is a piece of air. It's actually perspex, but they're both insulators. And we've irradiated it with, with electrons. So there's lots of electrons in here. You can't see them, but there's yes. a high voltage in there. Now, they've got nowhere to go because this is an insulator. They can't get out. And it's the same with lightning. So there's a huge amount of charge. It's looking for somewhere to go. So the electrons are sitting quite happily at the moment in rest. So how do we shake them out of that? Yeah, so we, we need to give them a high potential, a place, a, a, basically a concentration point. And I'm going to hit it with a hammer. OK, let's bring the lights down so we can see this is as dramatic as possible. Oh, that's quite moody, actually. <laughs> you tell me when. We're ready to go. OK. Oh! Now, although that looks like just a crack, it's not. If you look at it, very see, see the little light? There's more There's lightning still, still happening, lightning yeah. occurring as it goes along. Because it's still giving parts of the electrons. My God, how long does that go on for? It can go on for hours. Because bits of the electrons that are marooned in this insulator are finding this path which it created by breaking down this, this insulator, so melting it, basically, vaporising it. So the little holes are all what you see here, feathery holes. And um, these patterns, are, you know, you saw that on the people, you know, who were burnt, you saw that on their skin, because that's exactly the same process. Here's the same effect in slow motion. So just hitting it with the hammer creates that effect. Let's see it. And that was the flash. That, see, that is the flash of, of huge temperature. That's, that's tens of thousands of degrees centigrade because it vaporises the insulator. And then that creates that fern-like pattern and all the electrons are channelled down to Earth, which is why this hammer was connected to it. That is incredible. And, and it's still cute. going, yeah. yes. The first step in human-computer interaction is to teach the machines. To decode more subtle, sophisticated cues of our feelings they concentrate on the most expressive part of our body, the face. The team is led by Professor Peter Robinson. What I'm really intrigued about is these things here. I've got this graph output of my mental state. The computer is literally trying to read my mind, telling me what I'm feeling just from my expressions. For instance, the higher the green line, the more I'm showing agreement. So what's happening here is we're just using an ordinary webcam to, to look at your face mm -hmm. and then we're making uh, calculations to work out where various key features are, edges of the mouth, eyes, eyebrows. And then it turns out that various combinations of gestures, like nodding while smiling, is a sign of agreement. Yeah, OK. I, yes, I'm agreeing with you. I think this is very interesting. Hmm. And I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting good agreement scores. You're agreeing, and we're getting a little burst of the red trace that shows that you're interested in what's going on, which I, I guess you probably are at the moment. Psychologists have identified an incredible 412 emotions for the computer to learn. And even then, our facial expressions can be ambiguous. Mouth open. Mouth open's a very interesting one, because there are two reasons that you might open your mouth. Mm. One is... <gasps> surprise and one is ha happiness ah. and the difference is the color inside so we have to do a little bit of color analysis ah. of the aperture of the mouth to separate those two i can see machines are becoming a bit more human wouldn't it be great if they really knew when you were angry with them or shocked having a sympathetic computer could be really useful 
And what if they could also be more human by displaying emotions? Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? Ah, Charles. <laughs> that is pretty freaky. Charles is an animatronic head with 24 motors controlling his face, giving him human emotions despite a very dodgy wig. He's been built to see whether we're comfortable with an emotional robot or not. What's weird is that there appears to be some personhood there, but I'm slightly suspicious of that person, which is unfair on you, Charles, because I haven't met you really. I'm fascinated and scared. But will I be able to understand what Charles is feeling? Okay, Charles, let's have a look at your emotional range. Wow, that's very, very intriguing. Um, either it's pain or it's uh, frustration. I'll go for frustration. It's grumpy. Close. The second emotion was a bit more complex. Oh my God, furrowed brow, lip curled, squinty eyes. Oh my goodness. Disgust. Something like a horrible look. Yeah, maybe that's it. Arrogant. Arrogant? Charles was actually doing quite a good, oh, don't you know who I am, kind of arrogance. But I didn't pick it up. <laughs> it just shows how difficult it is for humans and machines to interact emotionally. But having seen just the beginnings of it in Charles, I can see that sometime in the future, it will get increasingly sophisticated. Well, the size governs everything that an organism can do. It's really the most important factor, and it boils down to this. We're sort of three-dimensional beings, and all organisms are, and they have an area and they have a volume. And when, when you get bigger or smaller, those, the ratio of those two things changes, and that governs what you're allowed to do. So elephants can't dance, they can't jump, and insects can walk on water. Again, surface to volume ratio. That's amazing. I mean, we'll pick an example. A simple example is, is how you cope with a fall. Yes. I mean, I don't know if anyone here has fallen any distance, but I thought I'd show you a, a quick demo about, about why it really doesn't matter how big you are as to whether you survive or not. So we've got balloons with ballistic jelly in them. Now, what's ballistic jelly? It's uh, like a jelly that you make for a children's party, but it's slightly stronger, and it's actually designed to replicate the flesh of the human body or a mammal. Give me a parallel of what animal we we're talking about here. That, that, let's say that's a hamster. OK, so here goes the hamster, and... The hamster's fine. Hamster's fine. The hamster's grand, the it's hamster has survived. It's jumping, it's totally fine. We can even see the hamster in slow motion. Can we? we? Can see the hamster. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah. She'll be on the screen here. Here's a hamster. <laughs> wow. I'm not saying the hamster's going to be the better of that. <laughs> they, uh, they did look like a bit where the hamster turned entirely inside out uh, and then reformed as a different kind of hamster. Yeah. OK, Grant, so let's move up the scale. As soon as you get bigger, even though you're made of the same stuff, we're made of flesh and bones. OK. And essentially the design is the same in terms of our body plan. Now, this is like the size of a, of a medium-sized dog, let's say, right? Yeah, OK. Like would... many people would have received at Christmas and loved for the rest of their lives. They uh, would have. Now, <laughs> and now we're going to drop them, I'm right? sure no-one here or at home is going to do this. And, OK, fine, but right. So... let's see what would happen if you did. OK, Grant, let's... OK, and... Oh! That is not what we expected to happen fine. there, is it, Mark? <laughs> It's totally fine. I would say that that is, in scientific terms, a negative result. Uh, yes, that it is. Let's drop the dog one more time. And do you know what? We're going to carry on dropping this dog. Are we? Yeah. Are we? Okay. Yeah, drop this dog until he does exactly what he was I trained to do. I think you should go to one higher step. <laughs> there, uh, okay, Grant. Now, here we go. Here we go with the dog. Oh! oh. oh. You're, you're applauding, but this is essentially what would happen to any of us who fell off, you know, a building yes. or anything like that. I mean, we, we're not... Due to our size, we're not going to survive large falls, and yet small animals can. Right, let's have a look at a replay of this. I want to see this happen oh, yeah. in slow okay. motion. You were just waiting to say that, weren't you? Oh, That's what you were going... No, 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 I, I, I glazed over, because I want to see this. Yeah. There he goes. Woof! Woof! Gone. Oh, oh wow! No, you split same. that there, yeah. yeah. So what can I safely drop from this height here? Uh, you mean in terms of... Well, what, give me a living thing to draw. Well, OK. Uh, that's, that, that was um, a pointed reference to these cockroaches, I yes. think. Yes, yeah. And 
these so, are so these should be fine. Twice. Look at that. I mean, they're, they're much lighter than, than our little uh, yeah. hamster. Anyone want to do this? Anyone want to pick these up and go anywhere near them? No, neither do I. Because uh, <laughs> actually, when you do try to pick oh, them up, on. when you pick them up, they get really antsy uh, and start <laughs> twiddling their little legs. I think they might be like horses, darling. They need a firm hand. Right, you just sort of you whack it in there. You're like, right, let's go. Oh, oh you're right, you're right. Oh, there we oh, go. Yeah. There we go. All oh, right, good for you. No, now. put it back in. I'm not what? touching it. What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> Come on, darling. No, 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 no. Put it in back oh. in. I've, I have a technique worked out for oh, this. Oh, you have a technique. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Right. Oh, look, it's it like it's 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 <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna pop it's them like down. a like a pancake. Actually, no, I have. Okay, tell me about them. So there's two huge cockroaches. They should be fine at this point. Yeah, even though they're huge cockroaches, they've got a very high surface to volume ratio. They are going to hit the floor. And this will show you something else about surface to volume ratio, I hope. OK, fine. Well, here we go. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hello. Oh, no, you're sliding. <laughs> you're sliding away. No. Uh, oh! <laughs> but they're fine. So, so actually, the, uh, there's another issue about surface to volume ratio. It's not just the pressure on the ground due to the weight, and so it's also the air resistance. So, in that drop, for something as small as that, the air resistance was appreciable. And that's to do with how much area you present. These, these magnets are so, so strong for their weight and size, that they're in getting into everything, you know, electric cars. In fact, the whole electric car technology sort of relies on us having good supplies of this stuff. And they're useful for other things as well. I mean, the... Uh... So the latest use, which is, I think, you know, sort of we're kind of familiar, aren't we, with bits of metal that magnetic. But what about this? This is some oil. Just going to pour it on just now. Just ordinary, just car oil, is it? Well, this is, yeah, it's motor oil. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to um, simulate an oil slick. OK, so okay. imagine this is an ocean. The traditional cleanup method, presumably, is to run a, run a line around it and try to essentially scoop yeah. it off the top. An inventor in Greece came up with a really intriguing way to get rid of oil slicks using magnetism. So he's got this kind of foam-like material. Have a look it's very, at it. Oh, yeah. It's dry, yeah. It's a bit yeah. like, it feels a bit like polystyrene. Yeah. And it's got a material that likes oil, so the oil is sucked up when you put it on top of it. And then little magnetic particles in there. So, in theory... <laughs> Let's see if this works. You can see it being sucked up. Look, yeah, yeah. Look it's that. definitely hoovering up the oil. Yeah. So now all I need is a magnet. Okay. Okay, now look. Oh, yeah, that, that is, is very I'll... satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? That I mean, is obviously, fantastic. if this was a massive ocean, I wouldn't be just spreading it further <laughs> around. But you know, you get the idea. This is, you know, there it is, and then you can just take it off. And then you, and that pushes off quite easily, doesn't it? It's not like it's it's, it's gonna, as yeah. glued to this as, as the magnet was to the table. There you go. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and could this be done though on a huge industrial scale, or is it? Well, they have done a trial. In fact, I think we've got some VT of this, which. Um... So when, you, when there's lots and lots of oil, mechanical yeah. methods will still be quite yeah. a, a relatively. And at the moment, they put detergent in, and that's actually the big problem because those little droplets of oil and detergent then get spread out in the whole ocean, and they, they cause a lot of damage. And wow. So this this is potentially a really interesting solution. That's a very neat. Oh, you can idea. see it there. Lovely. Well, you could see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, what else have we got? Let's put that uh, yep. back down. Is this oil again? Now, this, this looks like an oil. So this is another idea about trying to do oil slicks. But imagine instead of trying to absorb the oil, what you did is you made the oil magnetic, or at least respond to a magnet. Now, have a look at this. This is just a demo to show the idea. So this is a magnet under here. This, this looks like a normal bit of oil. What they want to do is turn oil into this material. That is uh, fairly astonishing. So this is, this is called a ferrofluid. And, and what it is, actually, is a liquid with tiny little magnets in it. They're so small, they're bonded in a way to the water. And this means it, just, it basically ch takes the water with it. And you get what those peaks are, are those invisible forces that we were all introduced to <laughs> at school about yeah, magnets the, the, the flux the, the iron, Like the iron filings yeah. that you would scatter, like whatever, those are just a kind of a 3D so this version. Is of... e this is evidence that they are real, you know? And, and this, is, this is a field that you can see. That's um, fantastic. But imagine you could turn an oil slick into this stuff. Then all you'd have to do is get a magnet and you could confine the liquid. And you just basically pull it into a... Yeah, into a well, you could pull it by doing it this the other way around. So if, I, if you hold that... OK. If I put the oil slick on the bottom here... Okay. Ah, <laughs> I know, I know. Goodness. You're absolutely right. Past history has told us that this is probably bad. Can you put that on there? I'll put that on there. OK, so the magnet is there. Yeah. Now, Feels all around it. Yeah. And then you basically could suck up the liquid. I mean, literally, physically suck it onto a ship. <laughs> <laughs> How nice is that? It's quite spooky as well. That though. is really eerie and wrong. <laughs> uh, really um, kind of creepy. And it's actually arranged itself as, uh, along lines of field. Yeah, and it's really messy to get. Yeah, because if I, 
Because presumably if I take that off, it's just going to come down, splashing down. It will come, do you want to have a try? No, I don't. I'm going to oh, leave you okay. to that. In the early 1600s, an Italian got the ball rolling by measuring and observing balls rolling. Galileo also timed pendulum and dropped different size objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to see what would happen. And despite upsetting the Pope, his ideas had apparently made God very cross, Galileo's work became the rock on which modern physics is founded. Later, free from angry popes, Isaac Newton moved things on by abandoning balls and embracing apples. Why, he wondered, did they always fall downwards, not sideways or up? By 1687, he had an answer. It was a force called gravity, which worked on balls and apples, and planets, holding them in nice, predictable orbits around the sun. In the 1800s, James Clerk Maxwell cast his eye over more mysteries. He showed how electricity and magnetism are related and can be combined as one force, electromagnetism. All that was left was to plug a few remaining holes. But by 1900, the holes were getting bigger. The latest discoveries didn't build on the old ones. Things like X-rays and radioactivity were just plain weird and in a bad way. Top scientist Lord Kelvin saw dark clouds hanging over the subject. Then, in 1905, a Swiss patent clerk started a full-on storm. Einstein at go go. 26-year-old Albert Einstein tore up the script. First, he claimed that light is a kind of wave, but also comes in packets or particles. In the same year, he published his famous equation, E equals mc squared. It says that mass and energy are equivalent. And if that wasn't shocking enough, he released the mind-blowing results of a thought experiment. So hold on to your heads. It starts with the assumption that the speed of light in a vacuum is constant. Now imagine that someone watches a spaceship flying very fast. What they would see is a ship's clocks running slower than their own watch. And the ship will actually shrink in size. But for the astronauts inside, all would be normal. Einstein said that time and space can change. They are relative, depending on who's observing them. This is special relativity. His ideas shattered traditional physics. He'd open a door onto the weird world of the quantum, where cats can both be alive and dead, where God plays dice and where everything is uncertain. His famous equation led to nuclear energy. Without special relativity, the Large Hadron Collider would be pointless. General relativity predicted both black holes and the Big Bang, an idea now endorsed by both church and science. Galileo would have been pleased. Well done, Albert. This bit of this tank of water here, um, when light comes through it, has to change speed. It goes at the speed of light in water, which is slightly different, and that means it bends, and that's the measure of the bend of the change in speed of the light is, is called the refractive index. And of course, if we have something in there that has a very similar refractive index to water, it would appear invisible. Because it wouldn't bend the light. Yeah. And in fact, we do. Watch this. Oh. Look at that. In there. <laughs> and oh, oh, nearly impossible to see. It looks like frosted glass. They're like glass. jewels. And they're, they're basically, they're this, almost the same refractive index as water. It's so it's very, very hard to see them. Another use of light, and this I quite find quite interesting, is, is in detecting counterfeit whiskey. <laughs> now, how does it do that? Right. By the so... way, can I just point out how great it is to see these magnets <laughs> are still here? Yeah, no. uh, Every time right. I come past, I can't get them off. They're here for a week. <laughs> but the counterfeit whiskey, because the counterfeit whiskey is it's a, it's a big deal. People yeah. are, you know, and so, uh, so but each, each whiskey has a signature. Yeah, so when you run if you take the original drink, you can shine light through it and take the scattered light that comes off it and then compute the kind of chemical nature of the liquid. I, I'm sceptical about this and its ability to beat me. Let's test it. Okay, uh, okay. Let's see. Let's try a bit. You take a sample first before you... Right, uh, so before I... this is the machine over here that's developed in St Andrews University and um, right. we're going to use their kit. So which one do you want to try first? Uh, oh, no, let's try this one first. Let's a, try okay, okay. so I'm going to take the sample of A. Okay. Okay. Okay, Grant. Now, now I have a taste you of You take it. a sample of A, but don't. But I know, you can spit it out. Methods. I think there's a spitting spittoon somewhere. 
I'm not going to spit it. <laughs> We're nearly at the end of the show. Uh, it's going to be fine. So, Dara, you, you can taste that and see if you know what type of whiskey it is. And over here, the computer is going to have a look at this sample I've taken. It's a nice whiskey. Oh. Uh, that's one of this. So what this machine is doing is it's taking that sample of whiskey and working out its chemical composition. And then it's comparing it with a library of um, chemical compositions for different whiskies that it already knows and seeing whether it is one it knows or one that it doesn't know. Yes. It's like a fingerprint of the whiskey. Yes. Yes. You need to it, tell it, us what you think number I, eight well, is. Well, I think it's, I th it tastes like a, like a perfectly good whiskey. I could, I'm not going to place it on, on some... Well, is it a single malt? Is it a it's single malt. It's definitely single malt. Oh, it's definitely single malt. Oh, yeah, very confident kind of about that. that. It, it, it what kind, like though? A, a, a label? Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's, not, it's not too peaty, uh, so actually, I don't know. Um, uh, Glenmorangie, I don't know. Glenmorangie, yeah. OK. All right, that's... So you run the light through it. Now the computer comparing it and says it's a pure malt, correct, but a Japanese. A Japanese pure malt. OK, so let's find out if the computer is right, if I'm right, is the computer right? Yes, it is. Very good. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Fabulous. Excellent. Let's leave that for after the show. Fantastic. OK. Uh, <laughs> let's face it, that's not a trivial task for a computer which knows nothing about whiskey, really, yeah. in terms of it. But actually, and by shining lasers through it, has kind of worked it out. I mean, I think it's really so impressive. the way the light is scattered by the hydrocarbons in, in that tiny sample is enough to give a signature, like a distinct signature, yeah. for any given whiskey. Clean that off. We've got two okay, more to right. go, right? So, so okay, we want to you, you which try. one do we test? Yeah, me? you try that. Well, I presume, I think, just by, almost by smell alone, that this is the counterfeit. So we were shining the light to it. Oh! Yeah. Oh! <laughs> hang on, hang on. That in and of itself doesn't prove anything. This is actually the bottle. Let's lift it up and see if my boat, myself, and the computer are right. This is, oh, well, actually, it doesn't even have a, it doesn't have a lid on it, to be honest. <laughs> it just had the word Scotch whiskey. This is Alex a... P. Yeah, with, uh... <laughs> that is somebody's <laughs> microbial flora uh, <laughs> made liquid. And this, I presume, is, a, is Addison McCallan. OK, fine, yeah. We're constantly presented with luscious images of food for us to slaver over in ads and cookery shows and recipe books as though we're just Pavlov's dogs. But how much of our reaction to images like these are a genuine response to the idea of eating food? And how much of it is our brain putting a spin on things? Mark? Well, I mean, you heard the phrase, you eat with your eyes. And actually, there's scientific evidence that we do eat with our eyes, or at least our brains. So, in fact, the colour of food, for instance, doesn't just affect what it looks like. It actually affects what we taste in our mouth. But what about what you eat it from? The glass, in this case, or the spoon? Now, most people eat with a spoon of this material, which That's is stainless steel. steel. Yeah. I'm going to contrast this with a material that is very unusual to eat your food from, a zinc spoon. Right. And one which you might be used to, Dara, with your ways, but the rest of us aren't, gold. Everything in my okay. house. Okay. Everything in my house uh, is made of gold. Now, the, will, uh, will the food taste the same from those three spoons? Well, I would have presumed intuitively, yes, of course it will. Because they're three metals, and who cares, yeah. right? Okay, let's try it. Okay. This is, I'll give you the, give the one stainless I, steel first, because that's, that's the, that's, so we're going to do cream. the control. The control. This is what you're used to, so you're getting used to this experiment. And that tastes like? Cream. Right. Now, here's the zinc spoon. Yeah, there is. Huh? Yeah, huh? it's a bit metally. Uh -huh. To be honest, that sounds obvious. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not well. It's different. It's definitely different. Yeah. Yes. And the gold spoon. Gold. Fantastic. That tastes creamier. Yeah. People thought it was just vanity <laughs> when I said I want gold cutlery, but no. Now, now, mm, mm, really, really good. Good cream too. Um, so what am I tasting, the metal's effect on the cream, or what am I doing? A bit of both. So I think, so when you taste any metal, or we'll put anything in your mouth, atoms are coming off, they're interacting with your mouth, and you sometimes get this metallic flavour when you get a lot of them coming off. Yeah. And zinc is very reactive. So you get a lot of zinc in your in mouth, and that triggers off this metallic taste. But also we found that zinc made it taste slightly sweeter. I mean, I'll show you the difference between these metals just from a purely chemical point of view. And again, we found that there was good correlation. So here's gold, and this is, a, this is some nitric acid here. So I'm just going to put a glove on because it's a strong acid, and if it splashes onto my hand, it will burn. And I'm even going to put some. Wow, glass you really on. are taking Yeah, it yeah, I'm taking it seriously. And I'm just going to pick it up and put it into the nitric acid. There we go. And I'm going to stir it around a bit. I would say there's very nothing much happening. Nothing's there. happening. Here's the stainless steel. Yeah. 
Now, again, stainless steel, this is, you know, this is, this is what makes it amazing, because stainless steel, or iron, is very common in the Earth. So, because we've created this material that is in, almost as inert as gold, not quite, mm. we've almost recreated a spoon that's as good as gold, but with a very common material. There's, there's going to be a little bit, a little a bit of bubbling there. A bit of reaction. Okay. And here's so the zinc. zinc, the one that I could really taste yeah. the metallic taste off. Okay, put that in. And immediately you're getting ah, okay. a, a very vigorous reaction. So actually the reactivity of different metals affects how much they interact with your mouth and the food and therefore the taste. Fantastic. So, um, very, very good. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Well done. Have a look at what freezing looks like um, when crystals form. And here are some crystals of sodium acetate. Now I'm sort of giving it an opportunity to crystallise. Right. This, this is slow and you can see it and it's, it's quite beautiful. I hope. <laughs> okay, ready? Okay, you can see it there, right in the middle. Oh my gosh. Now imagine that is your cell and this crystal is wow. forming. Okay, and it's suddenly, it's basically disrupting the nucleus of the crystal. It's maybe met the membrane and it's bursting through it. This is not a good situation to be in if that's your head and you've been frozen. <laughs> that's beautiful. It is beautiful. I mean, that's maybe what they think as they're being frozen. Wow. Yes. This is wonderful. I can't wait to see the future. No, turns out you're not going to see the future at all. That is absolutely lovely. Yeah, it is wonderful, isn't it? Well, there is a way around it, or well, at least potentially, because you can. F that was slow, and and you got these very large crystals because of it. And and as I was saying, they're, they're mechanical objects, and they are going to do some stuff to you. What if you could freeze it so fast that all of the crystals were tiny, really weeny ones? So actually, they could be accommodated within your yeah, within you, yourself. If you, if you freeze it so quickly, they, re they they only have time to go very very yeah, tiny, they, and then you... tons of them form immediately, immediately, and you and you get these tiny crystals. And how would we achieve that, Mark? Very, very cold stuff. And one of the things that these people are doing is being plunged into liquid nitrogen. We've got some here. Now, first, let's just show you, people, what happens, how fast you can freeze something like a carrot. At home, of course, you put this in the freezer and it would take several hours. OK, Grant, hang on. There we go. Right. You must think I'm obsessed with carrots, but they are good, they are good for you. And in he goes. Straight right, straight, no, in. straight in. Now, that's boiling the nitrogen. Yep. So that... that that, that object is much hotter than the boiling point of the nitrogen, so it's boiling. This stuff coming off here is not nitrogen. You can't see it's invisible gas. This is the quite plentiful <laughs> water vapour in the air condensing to form a cloud. Um, but basically, liquid nitrogen is boiling off, and as, as a result, that carrot is getting very cold very fast. OK, Grant, that's been in for a minute now. Let's take it out. That doesn't look augur well for whoever paid 50 grand to freeze their head. Obviously, they won't do that. That would be really, really offensive if they went, oh, your uncle, yeah, he's here. There he is. Uh, how much of him do you want to bring home? Uh, he's there. What can we possibly do to make a happy ending to this particular item of a tiny crystal? OK, so, we're, so it, science is unsolved, but one thing we can do with liquid nitrogen is make tiny crystals, and that actually improves the, the flavour and mouthfeel of ice cream. Really? Yes. Why? Give it, I've, I've seen this. I've, Heston's always doing this kind of nonsense, right? What exactly is the science behind this? Okay, so if you think about it, ice cream is basically cream, which is mostly water, with a bit of flavouring in it. Yeah. So when you freeze ice cream, you're making ice crystals. And when you're eating ice cream, you're eating ice. But it doesn't taste crunchy, it doesn't taste mechanical. Why? Because the crystals are tiny. And in order to get them really tiny, you have to constantly move them around and break them up or you just put liquid nitrogen in and make tiny crystals immediately in 10 seconds. OK. And so this, in theory, should make very, very smooth ice cream. Um, and what is this? Is this, this just is, cream? This is, this is a cream with egg and a bit of vanilla. All right. Which is a traditional ice cream mix, I think you'll find. And sugar. You ready to go? OK. And you're going to pull that in. Yeah. And I'm going to mix it around. You tell me yeah, when. Go, 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 go. go. Oh, well, OK. okay. So the nitrogen's going in there, but it's immediately boiling off. All the nitrogen doing is doing is cooling it down very yeah, we're fast. Not, we're not adding nitrogen to the ice cream. No, that's boiling off. <laughs> it's not a magic ingredient. OK, that's great, that's great, that's great, I think, he says. Is that working? Um, yeah, I think so. It's a hell of a visual effect you've created <laughs> anyway, even if it isn't. Oh, I've got an ice cream scoop over here. Just one. There we go. I oh, know, I didn't get that reference. Team GB four man bobsleigh. They're fighting for a medal at next year's Winter Olympics, running at speeds of up to 80 miles an hour. What slows them down is not the ice, but the air. The aerodynamics of the sled, its ability to move through the air. That is where they could save those crucial seven one hundredths of a second.
To fulfill their Olympic dream, they've come to BAE Systems in Preston, where they build the Eurofighter Typhoon, a plane that can accelerate to twice the speed of sound. Part of that extreme acceleration is down to this sleek design. Every single surface on here has been aerodynamically sculpted to slice cleanly through the air. And the bobsledders are here to use that same multi-billion pound engineering to help them go faster. To save just tiny fractions of a second needs kit on an extraordinary scale. Wind tunnels generating hurricane force air speeds. What the team are here to find out from project leader Kelvin Davis is how a bobsleigh deals with that level of airflow. At full race speed, 70 miles an hour, perhaps 80 miles an hour, the sled has to move something like 20 kilograms of air out of the way every second. 20 kilograms of air? 20 kilograms. So that's like 20 bags of sugar flying at you. Yeah. Uh, out of the way. Out of the way. <laughs> Deflecting 20 kilos of air every second, how hard could that be? Come on. Whoa! Well, it's enough to literally take your breath away. And at 70 miles an hour, it feels like your skin's coming off. But this is what the team are up against on every run. So, when the tests begin, everything counts. The sled, the body shape, even their clothes could slow them down. When we're doing the proper testing. With smoke to show exactly how the air is flowing, a smooth plume is what they're looking for. Any breakup of smoke indicates air turbulence, which increases drag, losing vital time. Today, they're testing the precise shape of the helmets. So what difference can a helmet actually make? It can make a big difference. If you, if you look at the athletes, the way that they're sitting, just the way they're aligned in the sled, the way that the backs of the helmets are protruding from the sled, any of those can make a big difference. These helmets are looking good. The flow around them is smooth, and the red line indicates that drag is low. But could a new helmet be even better? <laughs> the shapes look almost identical, but a tiny difference is all they need to win an Olympic medal. Is the flow smoother? It's so hard to tell with the naked eye, but the computer has spotted something. So we'll start seeing the line appearing here, will yeah, we? Yeah, you can just see the first point slightly below, which is good. Bit That's, of a good. Reduction. That's good. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's clearly lower. Exactly how the helmet has done this, we can't actually say. It's a closely guarded secret. The human brain contains around 90 billion neurons. It's the most complex known object in the universe. So called smart drugs exist to make it even more powerful. And one in five academics have used them, according to a nature survey. If you look in the internet, you'll find loads of examples of people who take smart drugs writing about their experiences. I've got some of them here. I went from a C average student to an A plus. I wrote 2,000 words in an hour and a half. My senses are sharper. My work is much faster. Now, I'm always putting things off, dreading the big pieces of work that I have to do. If these drugs could help me out on that, I mean, I'm really tempted to try one. So-called smart drugs cover a variety of prescription medicines originally developed to treat a range of brain disorders. Neuropsychologist Mittal Mehta studies the different effects they have on the brain. Well, if you think about cognitive enhancers, neurotropics or psychostimulants, these are all terms that you might hear in relation to smart drugs, but they really refer to drugs that are designed to treat people with cognitive impairment, such as Alzheimer's disease, patients with schizophrenia, patients with attention deficit disorder, traumatic brain injury. What are these drugs doing in the brains of people who actually are healthy? It might enhance information flow in certain brain systems, stabilising neural activity 
and this is one way we think the psychostimulants might work in the frontal lobes of the brain. Another way they might work is by enhancing the signal to noise ratio, so making the signals a bit clearer in the brain. I didn't realise it, but the use of smart drugs is allegedly quite widespread in the world of academia. Anders Sandberg is a philosopher who studies smart drugs, often under their influence. My main uh, cognitive enhancer is, of course, caffeine. But I do use modafinil, which is a prescription drug originally intended for narcolepsy, but I'm using it uh, for alertness and sharpening in my thinking. What should people be wary of before taking something like that? Cognitive enhancers, many of them are stimulants. And, of course, stimulants tend to rise your blood pressure and they improve metabolism and exhaust you. But also you can think about memory enhancers. Well, they affect memory systems. You might learn a little bit uh, too, too much. You can go a little bit obsessive. So there are always trade-offs. You need to figure out the right drug for the right task. In sports, performance-enhancing drugs are banned as we want athletes to compete au naturel. It's the same with exams. Schools and universities want to test your natural ability. So in that context, taking any smart drugs, well, I mean, that's just cheating. At Cambridge University, Barbara Sahakian is looking at the wider social issues surrounding smart drugs. I've discussed it with student groups. And some of them feel they're being coerced into using them. They feel like they know that other students are using them to get an advantage. But outside of competitive cleverness... Do you think that these drugs could help us to have a better and more productive society? I mean, first of all, we obviously need to have the safety information, long-term safety information. But when you consider that we do have an ageing population and people want to stay at work better, want to function in their own homes for longer and not go into institutionalised care, we may well find that this is very good. We may also find that people are making faster discoveries. Now, that is fantastic. What is that? It's a Lyle's fruit bat. A Lyle's fruit bat. Will he or she sit comfortably there? He will, we hope. Yes, on you go. There we go. Now, bats seem an unusual candidate for seeking out eternal life. It, Why they, bats? They would seem that way, but in nature, there's a hard, fast rule. And in nature, how long you can live for is typically predicted by how big or small you are. Small things, they live very, very fast. Think of, of a mouse. Yes. Whereas big things live much more slowly. They live in a slower lane. This is always said in terms of the number of heartbeats as well. Is that just a very, is that a very rough... It's statement? a rough... So heartbeats, again, is this rough estimate of metabolic rate. The faster you live, the shorter your lifetime. Okay. However, these magnificent creatures, these beautiful bats, they defeat this rule. Bats are very, very unusual because what they do is they live very, very fast, yet they can live for an extremely long time. So the secret of an extended health span lies within their genome, and that's the work that I look on. We're not advising people to sleep hanging from their feet. No. It's not. No, no. That's not the thing. Generally within animals, cells have a certain amount of time that they can keep yes. regenerating, yes. and then they stop. In each one of our cells, we have uh, all our DNA. And along each length of our chromosomes, you have these repetitive regions, these telomeres, because there's a big problem in how DNA replicates. That every time your cell divides and replicates, your DNA gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So telomeres are at the end of our chromosomes that allow us to deal with all this replication. But what can happen is that there is a theory that cells can only replicate so many times because as the telomere gets shorter and shorter, they get to a critical point and then bam, that cell dies. So again, this is a bit like these heartbeats. How many heartbeats can you actually have over a lifetime? So the question is, do bats have some way of either lengthening these telomeres or, or stopping them, stopping them actually uh, degrading? The oldest caught bat was 42 years of age. It doesn't look particularly happy about it, by the way. Uh, I, think... I loved it. We fed him a mealworm. He was just fine. It's hard to age him because they already look creepy and really old. Uh... Oh, this one's beautiful. This is very, very beautiful. He's very, very lovely, but he is really creepy. Uh, so... <laughs> it was the hanging upside down and the leatheriness of no, the No, that's all Bram Stoker's I know, connection. I know, I know, I know. Uh... Forget that. Think okay. secret of everlasting youth, not nasty, blood-sucking vampire. <laughs> okay, Grant. The, uh, you're rebranding the bat as we're going along. Uh, the, but the, the thing of it is, they may have something genetic now and we hope to find that yes. and then possibly use it yes that would be the idea so what is it that they're doing is there as we age what happens is some of our genes get switched on and switched off there's an aging re related dysregulation 
do the bats not experience this? So then we need to realize that, well, if they don't experience this, what is it that they're doing that allows them to control the regulation? And then the question is, how would we do this? May I, or would it be inappropriate for me to touch? You the, might want a glove. I might want a glove, really. Are they, do, they, do they grip? They will grip. OK. Will they hurt? No, not if you're good. OK. Wow, I didn't know there was an element of judgment on behalf of the bat. And I guess uh, the whole idea will be that if you can try, it's hard to get him off this, he doesn't like to let go, but you want to try and pull him off and get your hand higher. But don't use his hand because he no, might bite. No, I know. OK. Um, no, he does seem to be resisting this uh, quite openly. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Uh, you <laughs> very, very well. His little ears! His little ears are going round and round. He can hear things I can't even imagine um, <laughs> at this stage. But a pleasure to have him here. Listen, we're going to talk to you about some other matters in the future, Great. but thank you very, very much for bringing this fabulous animal in uh, as a demonstration. Thank you very much, Professor Emma Teeling. Your head might be only 175 centimetres from your feet, but time ticks faster up there by 687 quadrillionths of a second every hour. By the end of your life, your head is a massive 484 billionths of a second older than your toes. And here's another example. Say at 25, you took a job at the top of the Empire State Building. That'd be 8.4 hours a day for 260 days a year for 46 years. You'd have worked a colossal 14.7 millionths of a second longer than the people on the ground. But it's not just height, speed warps time as well. Take a sprinter, a high-speed train, and the fastest car on Earth. If the sprinter ran 100 metres in, say, 9.58 seconds, he'd finish six quadrillionths of a second younger than if he'd stayed in the starting blocks. Jump aboard the Eurostar. By the time you get to Paris, you'd have aged 168 trillionths of a second slower. And if you try to break the land speed record, driving at 1,228 kilometers an hour, then you'd have gained three trillionths of a second. Spend your entire life at that speed, and you'll have a whopping two thousandths of a second on everyone else. But to see some really huge effects, you need to go higher up. As well as going over 100 times faster than the Eurostar, the International Space Station is over 415,000 metres above our heads. Every hour in the ISS is a millionth of a second shorter than here on Earth. Spend your entire life up there and you'll be almost a second younger. Proof that science really can slow the ageing process. Janet, I, I want to discuss light to you as well as time, because light being a constant, was that known at the time? Was it so uh, much? It was discovered by Maxwell that, um, that the speed of light drops out of electricity and magnetism. So suddenly there's this huge discovery that electricity and magnetism with these electromagnetic fields are light. If you run at a train, it's coming at you faster than if you run away from a train. But light is not like that. So the fact that it's the same, whether you run towards a light beam or away from a light beam, is actually so strange that everyone thought it was a wrong result. And what Einstein did was say, actually, I think that's right. Everything we see and every measurement we've made and all we know about space is because of light. Yes, more or less. Are there other ripples that we should be looking at? Right, so if we're going to be talking about Einstein, we have to talk about gravitational waves, which is the idea that, that if very massive things were to collide, like two black holes, which is sort of the favorite candidate, that they would cause space to ripple around them, kind of like fish swirling in a pond and the water would ripple. And those waves are literally waves in the shape of space. So if you were standing by these two black holes, you wouldn't be able to see them. And they could collide, and you wouldn't even know it had happened because you couldn't see them. But all of a sudden, you'd be like squeezed and stretched <laughs> as those waves pass through you. And but, they travel at the speed of light. But if, if, space is, like, if, if space squeezes and stretches, do you actually physically feel yourself squeezing and stretching? If it's strong enough, you would. If it's strong enough to like overcome the electrochemical bonds that hold you together. Rio de Janeiro, home to 6.3 million people. That number will explode when the city hosts both the World Cup and the Olympics in the next three years. Its infrastructure will be pushed to breaking point. So here, they're already tackling challenges that we're all going to face as our cities grow faster than ever. 
This is Rio's Command Operations Centre. An extraordinary control room for the city. You'd think that things like this might be hidden away in lots of cities, but actually nothing quite like this exists anywhere else in the world. Essentially, what they've done is give the city a brain. Anytime, anywhere, if something happens in central Rio, they'll know about it here. This mission control is radically changing the way the city can respond to any incident, however big or small. So this is an incident going on in the city now? Yes, a bus broke down. It's a red circle where the, the bus is? The red circle is the problem, and the bigger red circle is the impact area. Today it's just a broken down bus, but it shows how comprehensive the system is. The overlaid satellite image immediately shows exactly what might be affected within the impact area, like schools or businesses. But crucially, it has live information about what resources are available nearby, as every one of them is tracked through GPS. We have two tow trucks near that place, and we have guards there, too. We call the, the tow trucks, we call the guards, and our crew here, they work together to solve this as fast as possible. And you can see details even about, you know, who the guard is. We have his name. He works from 7 to 7, from 7 a.m. <laughs> to 7 p.m. Do you know everything about him? We know his battery level, for example. Vamos ver o nível de bateria. 75%. So you can tell that he's probably okay to talk to you because his battery yeah. isn't about to go dead. We have his cell phone, we can call him. But the system isn't just about responding to what's happening today. They're also collecting data and analysing it. They're learning how their city works. We have discovered, for example, that every Friday, 5.30 p.m., we have most of the motorcycles accidents. So you can see patterns like that you always have a motorcycle accident at 5.30 on a Friday and start to try and work out why that is and then maybe prevent it. Prevent it put a campaign, work with the information that we have. It's that ability to learn that gives this system so much potential. Rio can monitor itself to such a remarkable degree, and it can adapt and predict. It has the potential, more than any other city, to respond to change. And as more and more of us choose to live in cities the world over, and they become ever more complex, I think this has a universal application. Not even the human voice has escaped the influence of computers. Thanks to automatic tuning, you no longer have to be able to sing to record a flawless song. Estelle Rubio is a singer-songwriter who teaches studio production at the Tech Music School London. Here it is. Wow. I have to say I was expecting a bigger mixing desk than that. Well, this is the days of digital, you see. Can automatic tuning really turn a bad Testing. performer into a good one? To put it to the test, okay. we need a bad performance. Bar, bar, black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One Surely for that the is beyond help. For the day. So what are we looking at here? We can see all the notes that I actually sang. Yes. What we tend to do is go to the nearest note that you were singing. So, bar, bar, black. Let's just see. Ba ba black sheep. So you're going through and you're drawing lines where you want the sound to be, where you want the pitch yes. to be. Ba ba black. Sheep. Automatic tuning literally drags off key singing back into line. But does it just polish up something that shouldn't have been recorded in the first place? Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags. So you can see now you're sounding in tune, but in a way we've lost the kind of essence. The of quality your... of the yeah. voice. You've lost the quality yeah. of the voice. Now, do you think that uh, all of this sort of editing and changing, do you think that's cheating a bit? I still think there are still great singers, but why not let everybody have a chance to make music? Music's about kind of the universal language, it's about sharing, you know, why not? Why can't everybody have a go and play around with their voice and make themselves sound better than, than they are? In studio recordings, computers are definitely here to stay. But there's one area of music that humans must be able to call their own, composition. Can computers reach anywhere near the creative heights of composers? 
Alexis Kirk is a research fellow of the Interdisciplinary Centre for Computer Music Research at Plymouth University. Basically, he makes computers make music. This is a system that I have. I call it Ipsys. It's a bunch of musical intelligences inside a computer um, who sing to each other. They sing each other uh, very simple tunes, but when they sing, they pick up each other's tunes. So the tunes that they have get bigger and bigger and bigger and turn into musical melodies. Starting with just a single note fed into the computer, the intelligences build up a tune together. But do artificial intelligences singing to each other actually sound any good? Alexis has a composition called Ash. So if you close your eyes, it's, it's like a four-year-old playing piano. Yes. Learning how to play piano. <laughs> yes, it's very plodding. It's very kind of precise in the rhythm. No human would play this tune this way. It might not sound like much, but to write a pleasant melody from scratch, computers have to draw on something they just don't have, feelings. Alexis had to give his algorithms emotions, but they also need another form of human behavior. As well as compose the music, the system can perform the melodies in an expressive way. So there's, there's kind of two layers to this. There's an, a layer where it produces the notes, and there's a layer where it takes those notes and it tries to express them in a, a human way. Although at the moment it hardly sets the pulse racing, the potential for computer algorithms to replace human composers is huge. Now what we're trying to do is, is get the dead cheek cells from inside of your mouth into your saliva, and then we're going to make a cocktail out of your saliva. I think that's probably enough. You can... in you go. <laughs> OK, Grant. Now, temptation is obviously to judge these by how murky they are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is actually... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at the difference! I know, I know. Right? Yeah, that, that is insane. That one actually saliva. is... Honestly. That, that one's actually filthy. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, can we exclude that one just okay, on the grounds of... we need of, to redo this experiment. Yeah, that is just bits in that. Yeah, there's actually... <laughs> moving one of them, I'm not saying who it is, it was him. <laughs> uh, we're all putting them all in together, by the way, so that no one's... We're not revealing any information. Yeah. For anonymity reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is, the, this is the... No one will be cloned from this. OK, mixture of... OK, great. Cells. There's, a, pro there's a, sort of a membrane on the outside. We need to get through that membrane. Right. What is the membrane made of? It's lipids, so these are fats. Right. So we need to get through the fats, we need to get into the cytoplasm, we need to swim through the cytoplasm, we need to hit the nucleus, we need to drag the DNA This is an, an enormously complicated <laughs> thing to be doing. How do we get through the fats, firstly? We, we do something quite simple, which is add detergent, which, as you all know, you know, will nicely mop up fats. So this is just common okay. garden detergent, whack it in there. That's just washing up liquid. So hopefully we're tunnelling through some membranes. Um, now, <laughs> this is just pineapple juice. <laughs> and what's in pineapple juice? That well, we be... it's got this protease called bromelain, and, it, and it's really amazing stuff. It, it's used to tenderise meat. If you put it on meat, it will essentially dissolve it almost. So okay. now we just need to mash this up. There we go. I think you can hear, hear the cells screaming. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, OK, we go. Now, there's, there's too many bubbles and frothy stuff in there, so the next thing is to strain it. Um, so I'll try to... Oh, you really have in. all the gear, don't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, try yeah. this at home with the old vodka martini. Yeah. You're like, shaking the, the cocktail that thing that you, you never yeah, use. Yeah. You got it like, as a wedding present or something. And <laughs> so true, so yes, true. Yes, it is, yeah. So, OK. Oh, wow. There we go. That's quite exciting. OK, that's quite Looking. clear. Now, we're going to get the DNA to come out of this solution by marrying it with this alcohol, where it, it's not such strong alcohol, this, that it doesn't dissolve. The, the DNA doesn't s dissolve as strongly in it, so it will sort of precipitate out. By the way, just stock. check how that is. What percentage of that is? This is 88%. Okay, go on. Oh, yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, okay. well, no, don't. Oh, that's okay. enough. That's properly yeah. now. Usually. Yeah. Okay. Polish vodka? While you're doing that, yeah. Generations of Poles. <laughs> <laughs> we know how to drink that stuff. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was the real experiment, by the way. Oh, is it down here now? Why is that your national drink? Oh, God. Oh, wow. Bits of my throat, everything. That's... DNA? So... Yeah. Oh, I'd say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, blood, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to get a layer of alcohol that's going to sit on top of this solution. And when the DNA molecules 
hit that layer, they, they, they're not, they, they can't dissolve as well in that, and so they sort of come out of, of solution. So they rise out of... Um, they hit it, and they, 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 you know, it's a bit like sugar in tea, right? When, when, you, when you cool it down, it's, it's not as soluble. It. And there is a cloud see, yeah, right. DNA. And that is really, really good. That is the, DN the joint DNA of three of you. Have we a, count have we a shot that we can get from here? Because that is absolutely it is amazing. Really wonderful, it's it's really, really clear. Yeah. Jock, you, can you come in here, right? Yeah. Now, that is very clearly, that's like a little web of DNA. Mm. You should all be very proud <laughs> of the strength <laughs> and health. OK, so now you, you can sort of gather it up. There we go. Wow. That, that although it looks very unimpressive, that goo, yeah. that is the genius that is life. Our understanding of earthquakes comes from expensive equipment buried deep underground. This bunker contains some of the most sensitive seismic equipment on the globe. If there was a magnitude 5 earthquake on the other side of the planet, this would see it. The problem is, even here in San Francisco, where hundreds of thousands of people live directly on the San Andreas Fault Zone, the current sensor network isn't good enough to send reliable warnings out to the public. Building thousands more seismometer stations at about $80,000 each isn't really feasible. But luckily for Californians, a much cheaper solution might just be around the corner. Dr. Elizabeth Cochran is an LA-based geophysicist who's passionate about teaching earthquake science to her local community. So we're going to try and demonstrate our different kinds of waves. She's figured out a way to use a cheap $40 seismometer to transform a regular laptop into an earthquake monitoring station. Here we have a sensor, and it's actually connected into the laptop just by a USB port. Anytime I move the sensor, uh, it sends the information into the laptop, and we can see the readout here on the screen. We're actually using these sensors to record uh, moderate to large earthquakes here in California and actually around the world. But Elizabeth's real breakthrough is to recruit a network of thousands of volunteers to host these sensors. All they need to do is plug them into their laptops, tape them down, and then they'll start sending vital earthquake data to a central computer for analysis. But this, this is so tiny. I mean, how, how does this compare to your professional equipment? So this is quite a bit less sensitive, but it has some benefits. They're pretty, pretty low cost, and we can have them, say, in every block or in every house. How does this become part of an early warning network, Mary? What these sensors do is they fill in between our, our large network sensors, and we can get more, more records faster and get the location and the magnitude much more accurately. Every additional piece of information we have will allow us to have longer warning times. Already, Elizabeth's recruited over 2,000 citizen scientists. One day, she hopes to have sensor networks on every block in Los Angeles and across every fault zone in the world. But I think the real significance of what she's achieved goes beyond earthquakes. This might be small, but I think it opens up a new era in science, when research isn't confined to universities and expensive laboratories, but it's something that we can all take part in. It opens up scientific discovery to everybody. To get your head around what a comet is, the best way to do it is to make one. So here we go, we're going to make a comet. And um, you know, the early space mission, uh, the European space mission, Giotto, to Halley's comet, discovered something great about them, which is that they've got lots of water in them. So, first of all, we're going to mix up some water. OK. And also carbon. So that's quite a common element in the solar system, and there's pretty much loads of carbon. Now, we thought it. that already because it, we, the, the image of it is, is a dirty snowball, is the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these things are icy, but they don't look... I mean, they don't look like a snowball. And also they found that there's some sort of mineral content in there, silica, aluminium and a few other things, Which calcium. we're representing by just sand here. But the incredible thing is the uh, Stardust mission, to, the NASA Stardust mission to uh, Wild 2, that comet, they found that they had amino acids in them. And that was really startling and amazing because that means... This is just some amino acids. So we're ready for bodybuilders, yeah. <laughs> but um, that's incredible because actually that, that might suggest, actually, that comets could not just be harbingers of 
of doom, but also they carry the components of life. I mean, amino acids are our building blocks of all our protein. Is there any justification for using Eastern European vodka in this? It's not vodka. I mean, it basically, of course, it's just not vodka. It's, uh, it's ethanol, alcohol. But that is interesting that not only did these comments maybe deliver water, but... Also but drinks. booze. No, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Um, Fantastic. But there is, so there's volatiles, there's organics in there, but of course there's carbon dioxide. And I wonder if you can help me. Mark, can you put on these gloves? And yes. in fact, we should all put on gloves and a bit of the old safety glasses. Because although this is, this is um, solid right. carbon dioxide over here, it's minus 78 degrees centigrade. And although that's not terribly right. dangerous, although it will give you frostbite, it, um, what we're going to do next means that it might spit a bit. All right, this is... Uh... <laughs> so just wipe that in here. So this is exciting. So how much yeah. of this goes in there? Just about three cups of that. All right, all right. And that's going to cool this down and create this, this icy black nice. snowball. Chief special effects. Yeah, keep, keep going for that. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. Oh, no, no, I shouldn't put my hand in there. Where's that no, spoon don't put your hand <laughs> into it. There's, there's a spoon in there. Here, here, here. If okay, a comet well landed, Thanks. all yeah. the rock bands of the world would have to rush out <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> OK, now this just looks like some, some cheap trick, but actually, in a minute, it's going to create something that is uncannily like a comet. Try oh, to get Lord. it to... So that was all, try and solidify all that water that we put in there and all the carbon and the vodka is all being squeezed together. Yes, I think we have a comet. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Now look, oh, that is... Oh, wow. Look at the jets, the jets coming across. Now these are, these are sort of, you know, the carbon dioxide um, subliming and creating and then cooling the water in the, and the, the water in the air is then creating this steam. Now, we and look, would, imagine and, that and there, would be, the jet, there would be jets on an actual carbon dioxide, of course, yeah. Yeah, as it comes near the sun, this, thing, this starts to happen. So as we come near to Mark, his charisma, the warmth of his okay. charisma, his personality starts to warm the side of it. And that's, that's the, the coma, so-called, that you see around a comet. And that's, and then, that's how we dissolve It's amazing comet. how much you've created a comet that looks like a human brain. <laughs> yeah, that's true. yeah. OK, wow, that's fantastic. As it was exactly as it would appear in space, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mark Meadoff, next comment. <laughs>
but gradually the team learned to recognise Cathy's different brain signals as she imagined moving her hand in different directions, until they were finally able to use them to drive the robotic arm. How did you feel when that happened? It was an amazing moment for her, it was an amazing moment for all of us on the research team, and it suggested that we're, we're on our way towards developing a technology that would allow somebody with paralysis to regain some of that mobility and that independence that they lost.